The game. There is more to the sport of football than Carl Johansson's brief instructions suggested, but not that much more. The first American football game between college teams was played on November 6, 1869, on the campus of Rutgers University in New Jersey. A group of 25 students came from nearby Princeton University to challenge the Rutgers team. The players took off their hats, jackets, and vests, and to minimize confusion on the crowded field, the Rutgers students tied scarlet bandanas, pirate style, over their heads. Princeton kicked off, and the first football game was underway. It would be unrecognizable to fans today. Basically, it was a chaotic mashup of soccer and rugby, with all 50 athletes on the field at once. Rutgers won 6-4. to four. The most memorable moment was when a clump of players choosing a loose ball crashed into offensive spectators were leaning on, and the players and fans tumbled onto the ground in a heap. One of the Rutgers men, George Large, took a blow to the head and came up woozy. He stayed in the game. For the rest of his life, Large would boast that he was the first man ever injured playing American football. First day after meeting Carl Johansson, Glenn Warner walked onto the Cornell football field for his first day of practice. The game changed somewhat in the 23 years since Princeton had traveled to Rutgers. Now there were 11 men per team on the field at once, for instance. But the sport was still just loosely organized combat. Early day football was anything but a parlor sport, Warner recalled. Many games being little more than free-for-all fights. After only one practice, Warner was named starting left guard on the Cornell football team. Like everyone, he'd be on the field for every play, offense and defense. He learned on the fly. Each play started with the teams lined up facing each other, the ball on the ground between them. Before the play began, the opposing linemen grunted at one another, spat, picked up dirt, and threw it in each other's eyes. A lineman on offense snapped the ball to the quarterback, who then tossed it backward to one of the running backs lined up behind him. The man with the ball started forward, and the defenders tried to knock him down. Teams could score by carrying the ball across the opponent's goal line or by kicking it through goal posts at the goal line. The ball itself was bigger and rounder than today's ball, made for tucking under an arm or kicking, not throwing. There was no such thing as passing. The forward pass was illegal. Modern players memorized binders full of intricately choreographed plays. This was not the sport Warner had learned. Early day football was simple, repetitive, and believe it or not, much more violent than today's game. A typical play involved the ball carrier plunging headfirst into a tightly packed wall of defenders, while his entire team pushed and pulled him. A mass play, as it was called. Some teams even sewed suitcase handles into the pants of their running backs, so teams could lift and drag ball carriers through the pile. Defenders dove for runner's legs, or leapt onto his back until he fell to the ground. But the play still wasn't over. It wasn't over until the man with the ball quit moving. So while he squirmed and wiggled forward, more defenders piled on, and plays ended in massive, writhing mounds, inside which guys would throw elbows and knees, scratch and bite, spit and choke, until the refs could untangle the heap. Then, bruising and bleeding, everyone lined up and did it again. The team on offense had three plays to move the ball just five yards. Five yards got you a first down. A fresh set of three plays to gain another five. So there's no need to do anything other than plunge straight ahead, play after play. The stronger team was usually able to smash and grind the ball downfield in short, steady gains, Warner recalled, until they finally had crossed the goal line. And unlike today, football players wore little or no padding. In fact, one who wore homemade pads was regarded as a sissy, recalled John Heisman, an early player and coach for whom the Heisman Trophy was later named. Leather helmets were optional and considered borderline wimpy. Hair was the only protection we knew, Heisman said. In preparation for football, we'd let it grow from the 1st of June. Warner joined the fashion, growing out his curly locks. This sometimes has its disadvantages, he later said. For when no armor leg presented itself, a man made his tackle by simply knotting both hands in the opponent's hair. It was hardly enough to dampen Warner's growing enthusiasm. After I'd gotten used to having my face pushed in and my head trampled on, I began to take an interest in the game. One day, soon after he joined the team, Warner made a nice play at practice, and Carl Johansson shouted, Good work, Pop! Johansson never explained the nickname's origin. Warner figured it had something to do with his being a couple years older than most college freshmen. Anyway, the name stuck. From then on, he was Pop Warner. Pop worked his way through school by waiting on tables at a restaurant, and played well enough to keep his spot at left guard. On the field, he paid special attention to the way his coach tried to get an edge using strategy, to use the word loosely. If a player was too good-natured or easy-going, Warner explained, the coach would tell 
one of his own mates to sock him in the jaw when he wasn't looking and then blame it on the other team as to make him mad. Did football really have to be like that? Warner wondered. Wasn't there room for a slightly more creative approach? He got the chance to find out during the 1894 season, his last at Cornell. The coach had to leave town right before the game with Williams College, and he put Pop in temporary charge of the Cornell club. Thrilled with the opportunity, Warner sat up all night sketching a new play. The next day on the practice field, he gathered his teammates around a small chalkboard and showed them how it worked. The play, number 39 in the Cornell playbook, was inspired by the fact that defenses moved in tight packs, bringing the combined mass of players to bear on blockers and the ball carrier. Warner explained how, with a little bit of deception, they could use this to their advantage. That Saturday, when the Cornell team huddled up late in the scoreless game, Warner turned to the quarterback and said, Number 39. The teams lined up. Warner took his usual position on the left side of the offensive line. The ball was snapped to the quarterback, who took a few steps to his left. The entire offensive line drove into the defense and plowed left too. The quarterback lifted the ball as if he were about to pitch it to the back behind him, who was also moving left. To the defense, it looked like yet another mass play to the left. But then the quarterback did something that sounds simple, but simply wasn't done. After faking the pitch to the left, he pivoted and handed the ball to Pop Warner, who peeled off from the pile of bodies and was already moving to the right. Pop looked up. Stretching before him was a wide open field of green. He rumbled towards the winning score. But in the time it took him to cover 25 yards, a couple of speedy defenders recovered from the deception, gave chase, and jumped on Warner's back. As Pop tumbled to the earth, the ball popped loose, bounced in the air, and was recovered by a Williams player. The game ended in a 0-0 tie. My first play as an interim coach proved to be a successful one, Warner would later recall. But I put the wrong player, me, in the game to run with the ball. It was a good lesson he'd never forget. No matter how good his ideas were, he was going to need to entrust them to much better athletes. Pop Warner would find those athletes eventually. He'd find them at a place called the Carlisle Indian Industrial School.